Right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Danica Ramsey Brimberg. Uh, Danica is in the very, very final stages of her PhD at the University of Liverpool, uh, entitled The Powers That Be, Viking and Ecclesiastical Interactions in the Irish Sea Area from the 9th to 11th centuries. She has a background in history and Irish studies as well as medieval archaeology, and her paper today is On the Metaphorical and Literal Boundary, The Placement of Furnished Burials by Ecclesiastical Sites in the 9th to 11th Centuries. Over to you, Danica. I am Danica Ramsey Brimberg, a PhD candidate at the University of Liverpool, researching Viking Age furnished graves in or near ecclesiastical sites in the Irish Sea area, and what they might reveal about concepts of power and status in multicultural areas. This talk focuses on a portion of my research, namely the preponderance of furnished graves at the edges of what is perceived to be the lands associated with ecclesiastical sites. These graves tread a boundary, physically and metaphorically, in what was perceived as acceptable by the clergy and the laity. Through careful analysis of the features of these graves, particularly as regards the landscape, why they might have occurred here or what they may have represented, can then be more easily determined. Some context is needed. The Viking Age is typically described as beginning in 794 with the attack on Lindisfarne and extending to approximately the 11th century, varying depending upon where you were living. In southern England it is 1066, in northwestern England it is 1092, and in Ireland it does not really end until 1169. Even the princes of Scotland and the Isle of Man didn't quite fall in here, lying outside of English control until much, much later. During the Viking Age, Scandinavians, people of Scandinavian descent, and people affiliated with Scandinavians traveled abroad. They raided and traded in various areas, but more importantly, at least for this piece, they settled in different landscapes, interacting with the local populaces. They have both affected each other, introducing new ideas, objects, and practices, including burial practices. The Irish Sea area at this point had long been Christianized, primar beginning primarily in the 5th and 6th centuries, and had led to the development of a number of churches and monasteries by the time of the Viking Age. At these ecclesiastical sites, burial practices had been perceived as having a particular form, but actually encompassed a number of variations. Graves constructed of earth, stone, wood, even chests with locks were present. Although also very, um, although um, there were um, other variations in how people were interred. For example, excavation at Carlisle Cathedral in England uncovered numerous graves, including furnished ones that were interred on the south side of the present cathedral, a prestigious location in terms of ecclesiastical burial landscape but the graves themselves each only contained one or a few personal items, issuing weapons. They were laid in earthen graves, supine with some slight variation, west to east with their heads to the west, and extended with one having their feet crossed. Meanwhile, at Kirkmichael on the Isle of Man, a Peterson type K spearhead was found grave digging, suggesting an individual had been buried with it among other graves. However, a notable portion of the furnished graves were located on the perimeter of the ecclesiastical site or outside of it, but within a clear visual eye line. While the notion of consecrated cemeteries started in the 10th century England, it began even earlier in Ireland in the 8th century, according to Helen Gitos in Creating the Sacred, Anglo-Saxon Rites for Consecrating Cemeteries. At the same time, though, the development of ecclesiastical boundaries around buildings through the use of geographic features, prehistoric features, and or concurrent man-made ones have been attributed to sites as early as the 7th and 8th centuries. While certain non-ecclesiastical activities, such as celebrations and markets, took place within these areas, other aspects of life, such as lay housing and agriculture, lay outside these immediate spheres even if they were on ecclesiastical lands. Therefore, a division, to some extent, existed around churchyards by the time of the Viking Age furnished graves in the 9th to 11th centuries. This is apparent in my own research. At 13 of the 26 ecclesiastical sites in the Irish Sea area, the Viking Age furnished graves 
or are located just inside the perimeter, just outside the perimeter, or in a significant portion was in a liminal position. Sorry. There we go. Uh, one of these ecclesiastical sites is the former church of St. Cuthbert in Kirkbride, Galloway, Scotland. Kirkbride is strategically situated at the estuary of the River Dee on a ridge, and it had a long history of being used in succession over time, including Northumbrian rule and Strathclyde rule. During the Viking Age, Kirkbride and the general area of Galloway produced extensive Viking Age sculpture, archaeology, and place names, which can also be seen at Whithorn Priory. In 1098, Magnus Barelegs conquered Galloway so as to provide timber to the Isle of Man. More specific evidence does exist for Kirkbright. While a later church dedicated to St. Cuthbert lay in the town center, the original St. Cuthbert's church was located to the northeast of the Burr, where a cemetery exists also along St. Cuthbert's Road. This can be seen if you look at towards the um, top right corner. You can actually see the cemetery on the map still being there today. Early textual evidence is limited for the ecclesiastical site with the first reference as Kirthbrichtus Kirsch in 1164 by Reginald of Durham as a stone church with scholars or novices learning there, suggesting a long established monastic community of some kind, possibly, by the 12th century. The place name of the town became an inversion with the Norse Kirk or church around 1200. However, the rise of the cult of St. Cuthbert occurred in the 7th to 8th centuries in Northumbria, and a cross fragment was uncovered dating to the 8th to early 9th centuries. Combined with the Viking Age glass linen smoother found around the later St. Cuthbert's church, Kirkbright was a power center during the Viking Age with a pre-existing ecclesiastical history that would extend long after the 11th century. At St. Cuthbert's church outside of Kirkbright Center, Grave digging uncovered a small black or blue glass bead, an Irish 9th century copper alloy ring-headed pin, and a double-edged wooden sword in a wooden scabbard. Typically gendered male, no skeletal remains are known to be associated with them, and the construction is not known, known due to a lack of initial recording. However, it is likely to have originated from an extension made in the 1880s to the cemetery up us on a steep slope, placing it just outside the boundaries. The pin may have held a shroud closed and the bead may have been a small personal inclusion. However, the sword and the scabbard are distinctive objects. The only other instances of a sword occurring with a Viking Age furnished grave in or near an ecclesiastical site in this particular geographic area of Britain is Workington. In this case as well, the grave is outside of the boundaries or on the opposite side of the Derwent River, though it is in visual eyeline and may have been affiliated if the ecclesiastical control extended in the same way as Carlisle Cathedral. In the case of Carlisle, the church controlled the core of the settlement and the circumference around of 15 miles. Getting back to Kirkbright though, its placement at the boundary of the ecclesiastical site is significant as it sits on a literal and metaphorical boundary. Physically, it is near the edge of what is perceived to be the original cemetery, existing just outside the other graves. Being slightly up a steep slope, anyone visiting the graves in the interior would have seen it and vice versa. The grave appears to have used a shroud, a distinctively Christian practice, while also incorporating a sword, which is more in common with the Scandinavian derived practices at this time. Metaphorically, therefore, the grave represents transition over the boundary between two different burial traditions, hybridizing them together and truly embodying a Scoto-Scandinavian identity. While more details about the site would be useful, Kirkbright clearly encompasses this complex relationship of this new amalgamated society and their burial practices. 36 graves occur just inside or outside the boundaries of 13 ecclesiastical sites. This is nearly half the number of graves that I studied and exactly half the number of ecclesiastical sites. In the majority of cases, the skeletal remains could not be determined either through a lack of recording or preservation. This is consistent um, 
throughout the sites, regardless of location in the ecclesiastical landscape. Fortunately, modern excavations, such as that at the Church of St. Michael of Pole, and outside of this ecclesiastical site, featuring either the early medieval monastery of Dove Lynn, or the just slightly later Church of St. Peter. However, in those that were recorded, the majority were of the male sex, an adult, typically late teens to 20s, although one female just outside the boundary of St. Michael of Pole was recorded. Orientations were primarily in an approximately west to east direction, with the head to the west, although exceptions did exist, such as north-south. Yet, they may have been a logistical decision in light of their position between the ecclesiastical site and the lay settlement, and variation in orientation have been recorded in the interior of ecclesiastical cemeteries. However, the construction of the graves and the inclusion of elaborate objects may have led a few of the graves to be buried on the margins, differing from the variations already present um, within um, graves within the cemeteries. One of the most elaborate graves in the Isle of Man is placed at an early medieval ecclesiastical site on Chapel Hill in Balladool. The grave is directly inside the boundary near an entryway. A male sexed inhumation was placed prone and extended southwest to northwest with adornments, defensive weapons, animal remains, and other items in a clinker built boat with a mound of stones and earth, and a possible mast or marker at the top of the mound. Yet, despite its elaborate nature, the ecclesiastical site continued to be used at the same time as the burial and afterwards based upon stratigraphy, and no other weapons were present. The elaborate nature of the grave and the inclusion of animal remains likely led to its liminal location. The grave located outside of the boundaries of Kirk Aston in Nakaduni also has a similar construction, but is placed outside the boundaries in another hill and visual lie line. However, these all remain in the minority with most of the graves in the ecclesiastical sites around the boundaries or distinctly outside being rather simple. Another commonality is that of the graves in general with animal remains were placed direct distinctly outside of the boundaries. In England and Scotland, graves with swords all occurred at or outside the boundaries, differing from Ireland and the Isle of Man and suggesting regional variation. While the Irish Sea is known to be interconnected, there clearly were differences that were occurring at this time. While we may not know the original thought patterns of the deceased and their kin, or the attitude of ecclesiastical authorities. Decisions were clearly made. Yes, in all of these cases, the burials were strategically placed, not just to be seen from different natural positions in the landscape, with bodies of water, political monuments, heights, and roads all involved. They were also placed to be directly seen by those within the ecclesiastical landscape. If this was done antagonistically, it cannot be proven, as evidenced by the numerous debates surrounding Belladul. It is suggested to have violently intercut recent graves, but even this has been questioned by academic scholars with a less violent perspective being taken by some. A more complex relationship among clerics and different groups of the laity emerges, blurring the lines of pra the practices typically ascribed to one tradition or another. Viking Age settlers or those choosing to affiliate themselves with them recognized these structures as the new reflectors of power and status and sought to associate themselves with them, thereby expressing their own power and status in multiple forms known to their own kin as well as the local populace. While this is just a small portion of my research, further investigation into burials at ecclesiastical boundaries needs to be done. With the furnished burials associated with St. Bridget's Church and the Church of St. Michael of Poland, Dublin, unfurnished graves were found there as well. While they could simply represent deviant burials, their positioning in a heavily traversed site, as ecclesiastical sites were, suggests that more lies behind their meeting. Despite their exterior placement, they are still directly tied to the ecclesiastical site, becoming part of its landscape. Expanding my research further into Britain as well could provide further points of comparison of varying influence. They are both on a literal and metaphorical boundary, treading the line between different social groups and different ideas of power and status in a mutually acculturating landscape. Thank you so much for your time. And here is 
will be available to stop more later, but more reading for if you want to know about the diversity of graves or boundaries or Kirkabrite and contact details. Fantastic, thank you very much. If you could stop sharing screen so we can see you. I'm sure we've got some questions for you. Right, I just wanted to, could you elaborate a bit more on the role of liminal graves in the ecclesiastical site? Because you kind of spoken about how they kind of been viewed in the landscape as a whole. I just wondered how you thought they were relating to the ecclesiastical centre as well. I thought you could say a little bit more about that. Um, in some cases, they're positioned very distinctly to still be seen by the ecclesiastical site. So in the case of Belladul, it's actually located not just at the boundary, but at one of the key entry points through the boundary. Um, you also see this with um, St. Bridget's Church in Dublin. You have, um, its positioning is a bit of a difficult one because it's on potentially in one description, it's located to the right side of the road, and in another description, it's right underneath the road. Um, <laughs> and they're all 19th century, so we, it's a bit it's tricky. Right. Um, it's re regardless of whether it's in the road or about where or to the right of it, it's actually positioned right across from where you would enter the church. So you see it every time you entered or exited the church, which is a lot of the furnished graves that I look at are very much tied to, in a lot of cases, entryways or paths that would be taken so that they are visual indicators. So um, I think that even, while well, we don't know necessarily whether it was a antagonistic point of view or a positive point of view, we know that they're the particular individuals behind these graves are seeing ecclesiastical sites, recognizing that they're signs of power and status, and to some extent want to take to be a part of them, even if they cannot be within the cemetery itself. Mm -hmm. I'll ask my next question then. So, what what would actually have been visible above the ground? Do, do you know for certain, or is it conjecture? Um, in some cases, it's conjecture. Um, in a few cases with excavations, um, they say that there is a mound. Um, in other cases, it's been determined that it's less likely a mound, that it was just um, built up over time, which is the case with um, the interior of Donnybrook. But with um, Hesham in, um, in Lancashire, as well as um, St. Bridget's Church in Brigham, in Cumbria, you actually have sculpture that is located right near the object being found, which is why um, it's a bit more concrete to argue that the pin found um, in uh, the church in Brigham is um, actually probably not just held to close the shroud, but the type of it is from the Irish Sea and likely was brought over and with this hogback that has got different iconography on it. Well, what kind of sculpture was found? Um, so in a lot of the places that I've looked at, um, primarily related to the Isle of Man, as well as um, Northwest Britain and um, Southwest Scotland, you actually have um, different sculpture, some of it predating the um, graves, but then in a number of cases, they actually continue. So they have sculpture dated to the, concurrently to the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. So you see money being uh, put into these ecclesiastical sites of people that are Scandinavian related or just really like Scandinavian designs. Okay, are we thinking Celtic crosses, that kind of ballpark? Um, some of them are crosses, so you've got iconography with um, Odin on it, or you have um, particular um, designs that are derived from Scandinavia, but you also have the development of a unique sculpture form called a hogback which um, looks, it's been interpreted in different ways, but it has a mixture of iconography. So a lot of the beautiful thing about sculptures is that you're able to see the hybridization going on between these different, and the melding of these different cultures, which the, my thesis argues you can see not just within sculpture, but it's actually occurring in graves as well. Mm. I've got so many questions about the graves. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to pause for a second and just double check and see if anyone anybody else has a question. So if you've got a question, please feel free to turn your video on and unmute yourself. And that way I'll know you're ready. 
Ooh, Lindy's coming. Lindy, you seem right, to unmute yourself. Have I unmuted myself? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, you've talked about um, a lot of these um, graves being by entrances and, and exits and um, 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 and it, it made me think of um, a couple of really major graves, um, early graves, um, where there's a real, they're Christian of course, where there's a real sort of humility, thing, people being buried beneath the entrance into a church and, and one of them is um, um, Pepin at um, uh, Saint Denis but the other in a more um, Viking context I suppose is um, I think Richard the first of um, Duke Richard of um, uh, Normandy was buried at Fécamp under the um, entrance to the church and that that sort of you know sense of um, uh, people are going to walk over them and and um, they'll be remembered, I suppose not seen, but very much remembered as people um, walk over them from the churchyard and, and, and into the church itself. And I wondered if you had any burials that were obviously under entrances as well as beside them. Um, trying to think. I know that there's, it's a bit hard because the church geography has changed a bit. I know that in the case of Workington, St. Michael's, St. Michael's Church in Workington, um, you have one that is very, very close to that, right underneath the entryway. And mm -hmm. then you have another one um, that has grave goods with it. And then you have one that is very much also very close to the entryway as well and while they have been described in some cases as being affiliated with the earlier ditch their time actually would fit more with the construction of the church so i think that you do have in some cases that where you do have the entryway um mm -hmm. it being tied to that <laughs> unfortunately Thank you. you're welcome unfortunately most of my ecclesi a good portion of my ecclesiastical sites they've never been um excavated or explored because they're still being used so mm. there might be more but <laughs> have you got any thank cases? you very much sorry have you got any cases of being multiple burials or have you only ever got like one at a time um so there have been cases of graves being multiple graves occurring in the same geographic area that are furnished so with carlisle you have a group of graves that are furnished with the unfurnished graves as well but in um, going back through and reading through the different cases, um, they've all, they're all singular burials or they're located directly on top of um, previous internments. Therefore, they've been interpreted in the past as being a person buried with people that were sacrificed. Mm. But in actuality, it's just a building up of the cemetery over time. Okay. And so, lots of rabbits and... <laughs> I was going to ask, actually, yeah, because you said that's... If you could elaborate on what, when you mean furnished, what kind of things are being furnished with, along with, you mentioned animal remains. I'm assuming you mean intentional, or do you so, mean lost rabbits? Um, in this case, unfortunately, I actually skipped an entire page of my presentation where I went into this. So that perfectly segues um, back to it. But... Um, there, I, there are lots of different objects. I categorized them based on, um, so adornments, you've got brooches, you've got pins, um, including those are the pins could be used for shrouds. They might've been used for clothing. We don't really know because all we have left is the pin. Um, and then um, weapons as well, which could be anything from a sword to a shield and then I've also categorized them as being other items, so um, items that can't necessarily be classified as particular, more utilitarian every day. So like a knife, yes, it is a weapon, but it was also an object used in everyday life in the early medieval period. Um, and um, sometimes you do get unusual things. Um, another common thing would be like a comb, where you have burials with combs. So they're in a lot of cases, a lot of the burials that I look at, you don't necessarily find offensive objects or you don't find a lot of weapons. You actually just find 
a fair amount of normal day, everyday objects that people would have worn on their person. Yes, yeah, so unless burial goods just just stuff. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Long story short. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's fine. <laughs> was, I'm dumbing it down slightly too much there. Um, but the other thing, I'm just thinking about what Lindy was asking about is the distance of where they've been buried. And I was just wondering if you could, the, 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 I don't know, the, the, what the elephant in the room is that previously I would have assumed that if you had a, a body on the boundary, it's a deviant, it's a suicide, it's someone who's done something they should not have. Mm -hmm. So is there a link towards distance from church, orientation to church, that's making you think these are special people as opposed to naughty people? Um, I think that I'm attributing it to in a lot of cases as they're not, in some cases the positioning, most in, in most of these cases they're actually being laid, they're inhumations, they're being laid supine, they're being laid west to east or slightly thereabouts and so they are following all these patterns. The difference is is that in some cases they're just located outside the boundaries or they're featuring um, items that might not necessarily have been considered acceptable within the church bounds. So they're finding this method of compromise. And in a lot of cases, um, we know that there are these boundaries occurring, but we don't have that necessarily area of consecration yet. So whether that is the distinctive, the boundary stops here, or is the boundary a bit more flexible is a bit of, ambiguity so I I recognize that there is a stopping point but at the same time it's a very flexible stopping point. <laughs> I was about to ask how are you determining where a boundary is and and also identifying if a boundary remains static? I define boundaries based upon what my research has said um, when they describe in a lot of the descriptions of the research I found of looking at the ecclesiastical sites they um, talk about boundaries of the boundaries would have stopped here um, based upon the whether it's the road or um, what they perceive it to be so it's projected in the case of Kirkabright it's based on the fact that it was when they found it they were digging an extension to the cemetery so um, that at least in my perspective it's like that's where it ended they needed to actually expand site further so it was outside of what perceived to be but it's based on information unfortunately a lot of data and there was not if there were any records from back then they've been lost yeah and might not possibly accurate anyway if they did have them so we'll see if anybody else has a question so again if you turn your video on and unmute yourself if you've got a question everyone is bodied up um, with this. Do I have any other questions? Actually, I had one more question and it was down to prone and supine orientation because I think you had some of them where they were prone and some were yeah. supine yes. and I just wondered if you had a theory about that or whether that was disturbance to graves afterwards? I think in some cases it's sort of it's sort of a mixture because in you actually find within cemeteries not all even within the graves that are um, non-furnished that in the cemetery that they are in different, some are actually prone, some are supine, so there's almost a mixture. Um, but I think in some cases it was done on purpose. Um, in one of the cases for um, one of the unfurnished graves outside of um, St. Bridget's Church that's near the furnished one, there's a group of unfurnished ones. And in that case, it suggested that the person died in rigor mortis actually set in. So that's why her arm is behind her back. Um, so I think that it's almost a mixture in some cases. It is the way that the person settled. In some cases, it's the way that they were buried. And in some cases, I do think it was post-disturbance of whether it is by subsequent grave digging or time or um, rabbits. Oh, rabbits. I don't doubt blame the rabbits. Um, I don't know if anybody in the group actually has any thoughts about the prone and supine because I wonder if it could be like a humility thing that like Lindy was saying just then I don't in know some, I'm just thinking aloud no but in some cases it is typically associated with um deviant burial um and um it's those connotations of it's something that I would need to 
need to look a bit more further, but most of the graves that I've studied, um, the far majority of them are all primarily supine and laid in what we would traditionally call Christian practices. The difference is, is that they've got an object with them. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. That's all my questions. Uh, Which actually in itself is still acceptable in Christian practice. <laughs> That's the difference as well as trying to work out what's acceptable in Christian practice in this region of the world at this particular time. I have a whole chapter on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to reading it when you've submitted. Um, hopefully the rest of 2020 will treat you well and you'll be able to finish yeah. it off. Um, so have a little Zoom clap. Thank you very much for your paper. Thank you um, for allowing me to present today.